I'm very excited to use this clicker. I've never got to use one before. So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to D Diaries, Style Guides, and Design Theory. Oh, my. Um, my oh, whoops, let's start the timer. Um, <laughs> 10 things I learned from freelance creativity that helped me make game art. Um, in this talk today, I'll be chatting a little bit about um, practices from other cross-industry art practices that I think are beneficial when you're working with artists in game development. These include basic self-management, so if that's something that you struggle with, you might find it useful, but then other things like taking feedback, color theory, typography, and how to construct a design brief. So without further ado. Upside down. Oh. Upside down. The oh, the clicker's upside down, whoops. Okay, we're just gonna. No, she does not like me, that's okay. Oh. Okay, so it's backwards. Is it? It's, no, no. okay, we're good. So yeah, hey, sorry about that. Technical difficulties aside, I'm Luce. My name is Lucy Mutimer. I'm the lead artist at Ultimus and all that wonderful stuff you heard earlier. Yes, I think he uses a lush moisturizer. <laughs> In order for this talk to make sense, it's important for you all to know that for a period of my life before working in game development, I worked as a freelance illustrator and graphic designer. And during this time, I learned a few things. And it surprised me how relevant they were to my work in game development. So today, I'm going to share a couple of them. Ooh. So if you'd asked me fresh out of art school um, what my greatest skill as an adult artist would be, I would have snapped my Wacom pen in half before admitting it was project management and organization. As a freelancer, you have no choice but to immediately adapt and plan your life. You often have to timetable social events around client deadlines and slot in certain amounts of required work hours around just life. This isn't just so you have an idea where your client's deadline for a project is. This is so you, as a freelance creative, can run yourself as a business. This means that, oh, whoops, shit. I'm very unprofessional right now, I'm so sorry, everybody. Okay, cool, I can't scroll. So sorry about this, everybody. Uh, you make the text smaller? That would be, I can't make the text smaller, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties once again, everybody. Thank you so much. Rad. So out of all today's lessons, um, I'll bring you, this is the one that surprised me the most, um, straight up in its relevance to working in games. While we have fabulous producers and managers without like, to help us plan our projects, it's crucial we learn to manage our own time so we can deliver the games we love and the games we make on time so without being detrimental to our own health and to our businesses. These are the skills I developed as a freelancer allow me to accurately communicate to my team and management the following information. How long each task will take me to do and to what level of detail I can have it completed to, an accurate deadline of when I will have all my work completed by, that I can prioritize and adapt if a newer task comes along very suddenly and requires my attention urgently. And additionally, it's also a very effective tool against crunch culture. If you accurately manage your tasks, whether for yourself or as a manager planning a project, you can avoid hurting yourself. And as we learned from this morning's panel, um, no game is worth de being detrimental to your own health and well-being. As a past example, working on Ultimers' debut title, Paperville Panic, we had at times really strict deadlines. I, if I didn't have the timekeeping skills I had developed as a freelancer, it would have been in very hot water. I needed these skills so I could plan out when all my concept art could and would be done, so I could begin texturing our 3D objects for the game, and then doing other tasks that are less sexy, like graphic design and Steam capsules. <laughs> but Lucy, I know time management and planning is super important, but how do you actually do it? <laughs> Firstly, there are some fabulous online tools. Uh, for teams, monday.com is a personal favorite of mine. It's this really amazing tool where you can see where everyone across all projects and how they work. Uh, I love Trello for task lists and breakdowns. However, for my own management, I'm a little bit more art school, as you can see. I find that I'm motivated by three things. Stickers, cute post-it notes, and obnoxious highlighters. I recommend grabbing these. Daiso is a great place. Um, I believe there's a couple of stores in New Zealand or your equivalents, assign work one color, appointments like therapy and things that you can't miss that are relevant to your personal life in a second color, and finally, anything that's social or self-care that you like to do outside of work in the th final color. I block these out quite literally, as you can see, um, so that I have a monthly timetable. 
Cute stickers motivate me to look at the pages when I'm writing them, and post-it notes become my own personal Trello board in my diary, with one being career life tasks and the other one being I need this so my life can run tasks. This allows me at a glance to see what's happening, and it also makes you a better, more efficient artist, and producers will love you for it. Designers are creatures of briefs. Our entire job, whether we would admit it or not, depends on one. For the uninitiated, a design brief is a graphic designer or artist, a design brief for the graphic designer or artist details the project in a couple of paragraphs, outlines the considerations, constraints, the legalities of the project, deliverables, and communicates the duration of the project. The design brief is both an outline of the work that you have to do and a contract of what is expected between your client and you. Learning how to decipher design briefs and, a tad more importantly, build my own for our team has been integral to the workflow that we have. Currently at Ultimus, we use a custom-made design brief form that just might be my own personal baby, I'm very proud of it, that takes out art requests. Additionally, I get plenty of requests and tasks that I have to complete for my job that's in-game stuff and less glamorous, so again, Steam capsules. Knowing how to make these briefs gave me the tools to navigate and figure out what my new client, management, the art team, et cetera, require me to do for each task. Knowing what questions to ask and which ones to document the answers for in a notebook doesn't immediately spring to mind as something that you should take as a lesson from freelance design. But without it, especially in the line of work that we all are in and we hope to get in, I would be completely lost. Design briefs help ensure the client's intended outcome for a project is documented in the beginning, in the, from the beginning. This ensures direction changes, documented feedback, and agreed upon plan between you and yourself and your client. And it's treated like a rule book for the convoluted scavenger hunt that is your art project. A design brief in game development can look like a multitude of different things. Uh, they can be visual style guides for your project. Uh, they help set the expectations for your art team for what you want this thing to ultimately look like at the end. They can be design pillars that guide asset creation, or they can be requests you make of individual artists for work such as app development, hey, we need an icon for this, or like banners for promotional work for your game. Without briefs, details get lost. Visuals between artists can look really desynchronized and really balked and information is lost and undocumented. They are a vital tool in reducing confusion and creating visual clarity for whatever your project might be. If you've never had experience working in a brief but would love to give it a go, using the user story structure is a great, great way to springboard into drafting one of these things. This is a basic formula I use when drafting hours and discussing design briefs, whether it be for myself or for others. It makes it easy to adapt depending on the project and allows for collaboration with the client or other team members or if you're working with art directors, designers, etc. If you're still feeling a little lost, it works as follows. Okay, as a role, I require the work so I can benefit. This communicates to your artists who they are reporting to, a basic overview of what is required and the ideal outcome. Let's have a discussion about a possible visual solution. The artist tells you what they can and can't do. And this is a chance for you both, rather than you just handing down a task, you to both discuss what you want this ideal outcome to be. Um, it's also a great opportunity to consult any additional team members that you may need to be consulting with on the project. So it's settled. The confirmed solution is the deliverables. Game set match. You've made a design brief, everybody. And Hopefully, you both understand of what will be produced and what you agree the deliverables are. The process that makes your brief a collaboration rather than a static task allows your artist to make empowered decisions within the confines of this, which means you get the best outcome for your project. And don't we love that? I love this GIF. If you're a creative posting art online, you should know that you aren't only posting for yourself. You're posting for the entire world to see. Once you embrace this completely and curate your various feeds with this in mind as a creative, you can become unstoppable. It can also teach you how branding and curating your online persona can elevate you to a new audience. It's no secret now that people looking to hire look for your online presence. By wising up early and creating a consistent brand for yourself, you create a powerful extension of your resume while giving recruiters and managers a glimpse into what kind of human you are. Doing this at first is really tough, 
to start out, I recommend taking a pen to paper and looking at what you already put on the internet. This can be really weird at first, but ultimately allows you to see how others might see you online. Take inspiration for an influencer you love, hopefully not a problematic one, and use them as a reference point for how a cohesive feed can look. Troll through a few of these, note down what they look like, how they feel, how they engage with an audience, and see how you can apply that to yourself. These are mine, this is my dirty laundry. Case in point, when I applied my logic to my work and my various feeds, when I'd reach out to potential clients, they would reach out to me because of my feed and we both already knew who each other were. Uh, they knew what projects I'd be best suited for based on what they could see immediately at a glance. And also, they'd know what my values and ethics were. We could get a pretty good idea of what kind of person I'd be in a workplace. It goes without saying at this point that if I, as an online audience member, see you behaving in an inappropriate manner online, that behavior is viewed as an extension of your work. Every game developer needs a folio. A presence online is crucial for a few reasons. Firstly, it allows you to have a place to showcase your work. Secondly, it allows an audience to see how you engage, what you engage with, what informs your work, what do you like to create. Because of this, I recommend that artists and game devs alike have at least three places to call home online. One of these needs to be a professional online folio website. Tools such as Squarespace, Weebly, and Wix. I built mine with Wix, and I'm no web designer, and it looks pretty snazzy, I like to think. They have cheap or free coupon codes in just about every podcast, <laughs> so pick your poison there, really. And the online portfolio should be kept really professional. Treat it as a one-stop shop for all your work. Additionally, as a personal preference, I recommend having two other online hubs to be more casual, like a Twitter. But again, be mindful of what you put out, or an Instagram being a, like a blogging platform. Engage with your audience and build that traffic and rework it back to that folio. Colors are obviously vital to any creative project. As creatives, we live and breathe color, and having an understanding of how to effectively use it sounds a hell of a lot easier than what it actually is. As freelance artists, how you use color can make or break a project and will determine if you get hired again. It's used to communicate mood, brand, and information to a viewer. If you cannot use color to communicate the intended mood of the work, it's unsuccessful, it's unsuccessful design. Brands and clients, most often corporate, provide a lot of style guides to try and curb a lot of these issues. And they have designated typefaces, colors, et cetera, for the project. Some games use these as well. I recommend writing one for whatever project you have. However, in the case of corporate style guides and palettes, in my personal opinion, I stress this part a lot, 99% of these, this is my spicy take, are really ugly. This is a good thing. When you're forced to use these questionably colored restricted palettes, it forces you to make striking visuals out of nothing. It does not matter what your opinion on this is. You can hate it. You still gotta make it look good, otherwise you might not get hired. Sometimes it's better not to have all the crayons in the box for this reason. Two jobs that help me personally hone my skills in this area um, were creating social media content for the 2016 40 hour famine in Australia, and I believe New Zealand got some of that content as well. And I also had a gig uh, creating school uniform fashion illustration storyboards. Clients as large and as corporate as this work in situations where color communicates a hell of a lot more than a personal preference. It communicates information. It was my job to make sure that A, I only use those colors, and B, I use them to those fullest, their fullest potential. But how does this fit in with game development? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> color in our games communicates so much to our player. It communicates tone, what's readable, and it communicates what mood we're, like, what, what is our game about, y'all? It makes our games look striking and unique. Color can also be used to make characters readable against environments. Can make or break whether or not a colorblind person can also view your project as well. To make your game pop purely visually, strip your project's visual back to four to five colors. A restricted palette, as mentioned previously, makes you, makes you think really critically about what is your color communicating to a player. Two examples of this used really effectively, uh, both of these. I've restricted them down to five colors each. Over here, we have the Strangerville Sims 4 expansion pack that was just released. 
The world of Strangerville uses hot, striking oranges, contrasting with spotless, at the beginning, a warm blue sky with mintos of brown and dry greens scattered throughout. Immediately, you're like, America's Midwest, nowhere town, maybe a Roswell influence. You understand it. You get a, you understand what the game's trying to communicate. And over here, we have Hollow Knight, which has just got such a great refined use of color. Um, it uses deep charcoals, purples, gray blue hues, all of them to tell the player a story that this is a dark and mysterious world. It also uses harsh white and black to communicate vital information to a viewer as well that's really informative and really easy to read. So, when you have every color at Photoshop's disposal, picking an initial palette can be super overwhelming. These are some tools to help you make that a little easier though. And hopefully stop inconsistent art and tonal mood swings. There's the Color Hunt Google Chrome extension. Every time you open a new tab, you get four, pal four colors in a palette that all work together. Users around the world can also upload theirs. And over here, you have Adobe Color or Cooler. Cooler, I believe, is still free. They keep changing the name. But this is, if you are so unfamiliar with how a color wheel works, play in this for 30 minutes. It's awesome. It gives you hex codes, RGB values, all that fun, sexy stuff, and you can easily make a palette for any Adobe suite. You can also screenshot it and save it to your desktop and port it into any other program you like to use. Got a great use of GIFs, don't I? This is one of those skills that's really valuable, but no one thinks it is. <laughs> Doing a variety of creative gigs, you tend to build up a literal library in, of Photoshop fonts. It's, a good, it's good to have an understanding of how to use these. They engage a person viewing a project. And like spatial design, bad type usage is super easily spotted in a project and rarely applauded when you get it right. Over time, you build up this library. Good type conveys a message, is readable, is integral to the branding of your game. Bad type just looks like yikes. When your project looks well designed and has a strong use of type, it looks more polished to a viewer that, which can draw in a broader audience. What does good type in game development look like? <laughs> good thing I came prepared. Here are three solid examples of when it all goes right. You got Life is Strange Before the Storm up here. Contrasting a clean copy of font with scrawled marker evokes a specific kind of nostalgia if you were emo in 2005, while, communi <laughs> uses, while communicating that your protagonist is like a counterculture sort of person. You immediately know going in what sort of adventure you're about to have. Overwatch, like the two factions in the game, the typography and color is perfectly balanced, as all things should be. <laughs> has a great use of negative space, it uses hard shape to communicate a militant feel, very corporate inspired, but then you've got that soft corporate color palette coming in again to just to make it a little easier on the eyes. Breath of the Wild, what hasn't been said that's great about this game, honestly? Uses a modern typeface that's consistent with past branding. Um, and then each letter, this is really interesting, each letter, the further your eye travels through that logo and that type, breaks down like the passing of time in civilization, like how when Link wakes up, it's so, it's so, this is a great logo, it's so good. All of these elevate the projects and make their respective games instantly recognizable to an audience member. We don't often think about typography in gaming that make an audience perceive them a certain way, but these are three examples that prove that maybe we should take this more into consideration. This is gonna get a little heavy for a minute, but I promise it's worth it at the end. As creatives, we pour ourselves into our work. It's part of us, it's easy to do, and at times it's really easy to take that feedback personally or feel dejected when an idea doesn't work out the way we intended. Something valuable a corporate art environment teaches you, aside from how to climb staircases in corporate heels, is that how to take feedback on your work and makes you comfortable refining a whole lot of concepts and just pitching them one after the other and not to get precious about them or not to get precious about killing my dial darlings as it were. Pitching concepts, it taught me two things that helped me process the idea of doing this. Have multiple ideas up your sleeve, don't just pitch one thing. Pour love and time into each of them like you would that one idea but be prepared that they might change and shape shift with time and with collaboration. Don't have them become your darlings, as it were. At the end of the day, these incredible creative ideas you have must serve a specific brief, and they must also uh, change with collaboration. You're working with other people. Admittedly, this can be really difficult 
to remember in the heat of those awesome light bulb moments that you have, where everything goes right and you're like, oh my goodness, I love this thing I've created. But we are stronger together and so are our ideas and so is our work. Every person on your project and their background and their ideas inform your, the outcome of your project and will shape shift what you're working on. At the end of the day, because of this, feedback will inevitably be given on your work and sometimes it means what you've produced might not be right for the project. It's not that your idea is bad, definitely not, but it can be difficult to feel like it isn't. Rockstar mentality does not help a project or a work environment, and it doesn't help your work grow, it doesn't help you get better as an artist, fellas. Instead, listen to those around you, be a knowledge sponge, soak it on up. It will benefit your work so you can collaborate and create something awesome. As an aside, um, for people who might be giving that feedback out there, feedback should never be any of the following. It shouldn't be personal, insulting, or dismissive. If you are in that position to give that feedback, make sure you're both on the same page of what the ideal outcome for the project is. Write that brief together that I mentioned earlier. Have a discussion. Understand how you each got to this different outcome than what has been produced. And then work together to produce a new ideal outcome. If purely for your own growth as a human, learning to kill your darlings can help you curate your own work, reach the best brief outcome in your professional work, and produce something stronger because you're working with others. Kill your darlings not because you don't care, but because you do. This slide has two meanings. I wonder if you can guess what the other one is. I'm gonna talk about one of them. Like having a diverse team with different perspectives, backgrounds, and life experiences, diversifying your visual intake informs your creative work. It makes it better. By branching out and enjoying art that isn't just finished game art, your work becomes stronger. Game art is incredible and amazing, and personally, an art form I feel is undervalued by the broader art community. However, that's its own talk, and I'm not here to give that one. When you only have taken the same visuals over and over again, you can find your work gets really stale really quickly. Ask yourself, what is the artwork I'm producing my game trying to say? We talk about style a lot as artists, but what's the substance of your work? What's my work trying to say? If you find your work's not saying much, it could be because it's not saying a whole lot. To remedy this, visit art galleries. We had an amazing talk earlier about what a good art gallery like in video game experience can look like. Go there. We like experience them, they're fabulous. Follow indie illustrators from different professions online. Twitter has become an amazing illustrator's hub just overnight. Um, develop a design vocab. Learn to appreciate the weirder art movements. At the very least, your team on Pub Trivia Night will thank you for that one. Look at art beyond what is classed as game concept art, please. Look at the art women, LGBTQI plus people, people of color, people that have are different from you, produce and learn from their work. The elusive art style that we all keep harping on about as artists, I'm here to tell you the great lie. It's what happens when you look at other work. That happens after years of drawing, absorbing, all this other really cool stuff that's not just one influence and bringing it all into your work. Everything you look at, even the stuff that you hate, informs your work and practice. The great book I never, truthfully never finished, How to Steal Like an Artist, goes into this a bit more detail. The theory behind the book is, for those of you not familiar, is that it discusses how artists, how we develop our style. You steal, quote unquote, what you're most drawn to in other work, and you observe what you hate the most in other work. All that good stuff, you absorb it, and eventually over a period of time, that becomes your style, and that's how it's recognizable as your work. When you look at something new, and if you use this theory, the work you consume is varied and diverse in origin, your own work becomes unique and fabulous and some and fresh voice to the table. Everything seeps into your work, and that library of knowledge becomes something you can pull from to make your work more stronger, more informed than what it would have been otherwise. Here are some great places you can go to look at. Behance is great. Tumblr used to be really awesome until the algorithm got in. Um, Vogue, didn't think you'd see this in a game dev talk, has a free fashion library or you can pay $6 and get every back issue for unlimited forever. It's yours. Please, fashion is a, another underappreciated art movement. It has its own nuances and understandings. Bring that into your game work. It makes your character silhouettes really strong. 
Pinterest is great, not just for recipes that mums love, and Dribbble is great for UI and UX design. We're going to get very art school now. Earlier in this talk, we discussed how important color and text were to a project. Composition and aesthetic balance is color's less flashy cousin. When you're creating an illustration or piece of graphic design, you have to balance everything within it, otherwise you can't read it. It doesn't look good. Getting a great sense of this improves your concept art, as a creation, UI design, and just about everything else that you're gonna do. By having an understanding of the hierarchy of what's important in a scene you're designing, you can distribute that information in your work in a way that's really appealing, really nice to look at, really easy and readable. And you can, when you develop that language to articulate what you want a composition to look like and feel like, you therefore, like, you're able to communicate that to a player. It becomes easy and you become a godsend to any game designer you might be working with. So, brief rundown for those of you not familiar. We have rhythm. Does your work have repetition of elements in it? Emphasis, does your work have a focal point for the player or a place you need them to look? Balance, does your work have distribution of visual weight? Is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? Does your work, contrast, sorry about that. Does your work have sharp, just opposing elements? How do they stand out from one another? Proportion. Do the elements of your work sit comfortably next to each other within the context of a bigger piece? Very important for game artists. Does your environments work with your UI? All that stuff needs to, that's relevant for readability. Gradation. Do your elements have a sense of progression, tonal or otherwise? And do they have a gradual change that link them that contributes to the overall intent of the piece? Having an understanding of the language of art will help you critique your own work, other work, and makes you better at giving that feedback to others when you're maybe not on the same page. It allows you to communicate the tone to your player as well. This is really cheesy, short and sweet. Be nice. It's an odd one. It's really weird to have this sitting next to color theory and oh my God, project management, isn't it great? But I'm gonna be very blunt I'm very vulnerable for two minutes. This is a new look for me. I would not be standing here in front of you without it. Working in freelance and the games industry, as we've seen from really come to light in the past couple of years, you're in and out of offices constantly. You work alongside people that you don't know. You're often called in because an employee or a group of people have been asked to leave very suddenly and for one reason or another and you have to step in immediately to that project. You're very suddenly having to adapt to a foreign environment, each with its own office politics and culture. Sometimes that culture's not good. Sometimes the social politics of a scene consume people and sometimes people just have shit days. Showing a little kindness and being nice to people really helps then. It's genuinely nice to be genuinely nice. However, for you Slytherins out there that maybe lead a little bit more incentive, I've had people call old agents of mine to tell them I was a delight to work with so all my contracts would get extended so I could continue. More jobs in my industry that normally would not be given to midweight juniors in my position came my way. It gave me a repetition as someone young, but someone good to work with. And I make the office a little sunnier in those darker days. If you are positive, not just to your leaders, not just to suck up, but to those around you, word travels fast. And it leads to not just positive workplace environment, but surprise, surprise, being a genuine and lovely person makes people want to hire you. Be nice for the sake of it, you never know who might need it. And with that, I've gone really over time and I do apologize for that. Um, and thank you for putting up with me with my technical difficulties. Um, I hope you enjoyed my little talk. Um, and then I'd like to thank the fine folks at Play by Play for inviting me to New Zealand. And I'd also like to thank Lucy Morris for mentoring me during this talk. Um, feel free to tweet me. My email address is on my Twitter page as well. I very sillily didn't put up there. And I also love questions about art and any endgame theories that you want to discuss. <laughs> so yes, without further ado, that's me. Please talk to me afterwards. <laughs>